Chaff. Coming up this week, Balin, the rabbit, which I think I've already kind of beaten into the dust here. I do not like splashing Balin at all. And then I want to pay my respects here for Ben, because <laughs> unfortunately, Grief also got the hammer hit in my uh, <laughs> Turn three, they played Laughing Jasper Flint. Is, he's a lizard, isn't he? He's a lizard. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Traficionados? Welcome back to Draft Chap. This is episode 213. I'm one of your hosts, Ben. Coming at me live is Tyler. How do you feel about frogs? Uh, dude, I'm jumping for joy for frogs. <laughs> How do you feel about splashing? Uh, I, I do enjoy a good splash here and then. All right. Uh, frogs do too, I hear. So Yeah. Maybe not in this uh, set, but in general, yeah. Gee, well, that's what we're here to talk about today. Before we get into it, a little bit of housekeeping. If you're not in Discord, get in there. <laughs> it's a great place to be. You can hop on into the, <laughs> go splash your way into the, no, uh, into the Discord. Uh, in there, you can find everything from just general magic discussion to what's the picks to posting deck lists to uh, people attempting to catch up to the number of trophies that I've posted. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing a little shade to the rest of the fishing out no, no. over here. <laughs> I, I, full respect. People are doing very well at that. Um, I might have been surpassed. It's, I don't know. I haven't checked because I didn't think it could be caught. <laughs> Maybe I <can> go check. <laughs> no, actually, um, I, I had a couple of very embarrassing drafts in the, in the last couple of days. I, I O2'd with a, uh, <laughs> with a deck we're about to see in the Kraken draft that I'm well, anyway, uh, <laughs> patrons, thank you for supporting my O2s. <laughs> uh, I, I promise my, my gems come not from you, but uh, from, from me. Uh, patrons, thank you. Y'all are the best. And honestly, you help keep the show going. You help support things like the bounty boards, which are still going. People haven't been posting too many from this set. That means there's a lot of packs to be claimed. So if you have been doing cool things in this set, hop on over to the bounty boards, see what's up with those. Uh, by the way, stickers. <laughs> Well, we, we've been looking at the sticker draft from behind the scenes. Uh, not like a draft, but like a literal sticker, like a rough draft from our artist. What do you think? Oh, man, it's looking really great. I don't want to spoil anything for anybody, but I'm very excited for this. Yeah, the Stoat Goat has never looked better. So uh, if you are interested in getting one of those stickers and a sticker of all the other draft chap heroes that I've got, kind of just laying on my desk, uh, mailed directly to you, hop on over to Patreon and uh, subscribe. <laughs> Hop on over to Patreon and sub at the sticker tier. There's a lot of other cool stuff in there too. By the way, YouTube still going strong. You can see some live drafts from this week and last week. And honestly, go check out the Builder's Talent video that we did because that might be the most fun thing I have done in Magic in a long time. I was going to say that that like revitalized my love for Bloomboro. I was starting to get a little stale on Bloomboro, but watching Builder's Talent pop off is something to witness. I haven't had a good Builder's Talent deck since then, so that might be my one and done with it in the format, but I'm so glad that came together. Let's take a look here at our crack of draft. I've got a weird one here. I've got a pack one, pick four. Yeah, so my, my pack one, pick one, I slammed a Thorn Vault Forager. That's the squirrel mana dork. Uh, my pick two, I actually grabbed a Downwind Ambusher. That's the uh, the skunk that comes in to kill something or give minus one minus one been liking this card a lot there's a lot of pesky x1s that you can just basically just kill for free with this thing and then my pick three which put me firmly into black was a pick three osteomancer adept the two two death touch that lets you flashback creatures if you forage them i don't know what's the right word for that forage back i would go with it. forage back yeah <laughs> finality counter back yeah, that's true know. yeah yeah really annoying card Oh, uh, definitely. This is a great <laughs> squirrel starting here. Two rares this quick and like really great ones for the squirrel deck. You have a yeah. squirrel tutor that ramps you out. Yeah, wow. Well, now let's take a look at pack one pick four because my prospects go downhill very quickly. We've got a mind drill assailant. That's the four mana two five that is threshold three zero. I mean, this is this is pretty filler, pretty replaceable, right? Yeah, no, not, not too exciting. Yeah, even though it is kind of a black card like you could play this in a, in a green black deck if you had to if you're foraging which my deck obviously really wants to osteomancer adept and thorn vault forager these are both begging you to forage uh mind drill assailant it, you'll, you'll turn it off if you forage too much so yeah you'll turn it off but it does have surveil which does let you fill your yard it's kind of mm -hmm. like a yeah depends on which vector you want to play into with it yeah and if you're playing into both if you're playing both sides <laughs> no it doesn't work squirrels and rats don't get along in this set 
Yeah. Three tree mascot. I, I have actually, I, I've gone up and down on this card. I, I'm back to thinking it's junk. <laughs> I, I do too. I mean, it's going to be pretty relevant in today's discussion, I think. But mm. yeah. True. I've definitely gotten out of some tight mana situations with this guy. Treetop Sentries. Uh, this is a squirrel. It does go with the squirrel stuff that I've got so far. This is the uh, the four mana two four reach, and you can forge to draw a card. I just haven't found this to be a super high impact one. No, I agree. I think my issue with the squirrels deck is either I lean too far into forging and not enough into mill, or too much into mill and not enough into forging. And you've already got a lot of great forge outlets right now. Mm, so yeah. I, yeah, this card's. Eh. Yeah, if this was like a cash grab or something, or definitely. Um, a dagger fang duo to stock the graveyard it would have been a windmill slam for that but this squirrel honestly pretty filler level might of the meek extremely off vector for us that's the mouse can trip uh, I, I had a deck over the weekend where i had five uh what is it the the red white mentor uh mm. whatever that one seed something whatever that one's called uh and i did i played as many might of the meeks as i could get uh, that was that was a pretty sick. I don't blame you. This card's nuts. I mean, I I, I think this is even seen standard play right now. Boris Agro love this wow, loves really? this card. Yeah, cool. Run away together is up next. Pretty far off from our vector, uh, but I, I do like it. If you're playing blue and you have the things to go with it, it pairs really well with stuff like Dower Port Mage or uh, Pond Prophet. Pillated Provisioner. Nah, do we, do we have to talk about this? Do we have no. to talk about this? I gotta <laughs> say though, th this is the last common in the pack and. Green blacks looking already pretty cut off. How are you feeling at this point in the draft? I mean, I, I'm basically imagining that there's at least two people at every table that wind up in squirrels in green black in some way. Uh, and it just so happens that I had a good start, but that doesn't mean I'm going to have a good rest of the pack, right? Correct. Yeah. Short bow is our first uncommon. I know you still love this card, right? I love this card. I, I, I'm just an, I'm a Boros equipment junkie. So the fact that it equips for one, you know, it's so versatile. Uh, I'll always love this card. Yeah. Uh, the fact that it gives Vigilance and Reach, that, that's kind of a really great combo. It's not yes. like a, like Menace Reach that kind of is like, all right, well, you're only ever getting one thing out no. of it. Vigilance and Reach, you're definitely using yeah. both halves. It makes a great attacker and blocker. It's a win-win. Mm -hmm. Next I'm coming here is Splash Lasher. <laughs> this one's pretty cool. Uh, I, I had a game where I cast three of these in a row. But oh, I went, I went, gross. kicked Splash Lasher, kicked Splash Lasher, kicked Splash Lasher. I don't even think my, I, I wasn't that close to killing them, but my opponent just scooped because like. What you got to do is do three Splash Lashers and then on their upkeep when the, the, uh, whatever thing, the, uh, what's it called? The stun counter comes off, you run away together and bounce both of them back. You just send them into this eternal Start loop of hell. Yeah. yeah. Uh, unfortunately, still kind of far away from what I'm trying to do here though with my squirrel plan. Uh, Jolly Gerbils. I don't actually think I've triggered this. This is the one where you, if you give a gift, you draw a card. No, this is more of just like a, I don't know. It's like a flex card. I feel like I like playing this just to be like, I got the durable in my deck. It's, it's all it does. I mean, it's a decent body. Yeah. It's a two or three for two. It's a, it's a hamster instead of a rabbit or a mouse or something. Well, like... it, they call it Jolly Gerbils, and then they say Hamster Citizen. You got to make up your mind at some point, Wizards. <laughs> are, they, are they different things? Uh, excuse my lack of mammal knowledge, but <laughs> I'd assume so if they have different names. But who? Do, what do I know? Yeah. Uh, anyway, I guess you could play this if you have a couple copies of like uh, Crumb and Get It or Parting Gust, but obviously pretty far away from that. We have a rare in this pack, but it's Sun Spine Lynx. What a wide delta between how sick this looks and how good it is. <laughs> <laughs> this Why does it look sun? that cool? Yeah, I was going to say, like, you, you have this... Yeah, this feels like a burn card, and it does nothing with burn. Yeah, like, it should... This is the thing that should be increasing the damage dealt by, yes. by like, the, your red stuff, right? But Oh, uh, I mean, with the Valley it, Caller, yeah. Yeah, it, it, this thing is the sun, right? Is that what's happening in the mythos, like... One that like like um, Eluge is the flood. This is the sun. Is that That's it? true? Yeah, Eluge is a, a legendary, but this is not a legendary. That implies there's multiple of these running around. <laughs> yeah, that that would <laughs> cause some pretty weird things to happen with the day night cycle. The bats probably are going nuts trying to track these things. Hmm. I I, I have a couple physics notes on <laughs> having a sun attached to your back. The astrophysicist is about to break down <laughs> Sun Spine Lynx. Look, all I'm saying is that guy's. Uh, I don't know. I wonder if it, if it talked, it would if it would have like a really squeaky voice if it has a lot of helium in it. From like I don't know. There's this thing called like, nuclear fission. Like, there, there's the well, yeah. Like so the, the fusion happening in the core of a sun 
uh, if you start with like a base, this is a different podcast now. If you start with like a, just a base collapse of like hydrogen, which is pretty abundant, uh, it, if it gets within a certain limit, the name of which I kind of forget, someone let me know in Discord. Is it the rally genes limit or like, I don't know, so, some limit. <laughs> Uh, if you get enough hydrogen in, in, in one space, it smushes into itself. And if it does that violently enough, it can kickstart fusion into helium. And then uh, the PP cycle takes over and there's the CNO cycle. And then there's a bunch of other stuff that happens. And eventually you wind up with iron. So does this imply that... Ben what happens Nye, the science dies? guy. <laughs> <laughs> does, it, does it go supernova? Does it, does it collapse into a white dwarf if it's small? What happens if the two of them collide? Does it form a black hole? Oh, <laughs> man. Depends how big they are. And that's, okay. that's the truth. <laughs> anyway, uh, this pack is... Yikes. Not, not exactly great. what you want to see, right? No. I mean, I can tell what you picked. And I think you made the right pick here. <laughs> yeah. Which, <laughs> which is short bow. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's colorless. So it's going to fit into anything you end up going into. So mm -hmm. it leaves you with options. Uh, the only other thing here is the centuries that is even viable, and it's not a great pick. Yeah, I was kind of vindicated a couple picks after this. I, I saw a glide dive duo, but notice in this next pick, uh, not a single green card. Mm. And uh, the next pack, same thing once again. I ended yeah. up taking a, a fire glass mentor out of the one after that. It was, I mean, maybe I could have taken a hidden grotto instead. At this point, I was thinking like maybe red black. I obviously noticed that I went two packs without seeing like a green card that I yeah. even remotely wanted. So I was like, uh, maybe moving to red a little bit, but red wasn't Ooh. looking that good either. Did see scavenger's talent after That's that. That's kind of crazy like, right. to see. Yeah. Cause that almost makes it feel like nobody else is in the squirrel vector. Cause this is such a great card for that. That's the funny part. Pick oh. eight. I got a corpse fairy cultivator, which said to me, all right, green is mega cut. Yeah. Maybe there's like rabbits, rabbits to my right or something like that. But, but squirrels itself is open. I wound up with a pretty sick looking deck. So uh, I wound up getting a Camellia and I got to pick four Rotten Mouth Viper in wow. pack three, which completely obliterated everything I thought I knew about like black being. Uh, so black, black was super open, right? Yeah. Uh, this deck went 0 2, which I'm Whoa. very disappointed in. This is maybe uh, the most embarrassing. I, I had some really awful draws, a bunch of mulligans. And I kind of did whiff on my two drops. I was playing uh, the short bow and bumbleflower share pot. And I had a couple talents. I had the bandit's talent and scavenger's talent. But yeah. my early plays just didn't really align with what my opponents were doing. And I never saw the Viper. I never saw the duos. I saw the Camellia once. It was it was a pretty embarrassing draft. Just no, luck uh, of the draw cash sometimes. Cash grabs. Yeah. Oh, no cash grabs in the squirrel deck's kind of kind of rough. Yeah. But this is like a really solid, you know, you have some really great rares and great bombs, but Magic's I, I bet if, um, yeah, yeah, totally. You know? I, I bet if I were to play 10 more matches with this, I probably could go like 6 4 overall with it, yeah. or, or maybe better. I don't know. But anyway, I thankfully did not resort to splashing red and making my mana worse. Transition <laughs> to our, to our that main argument topic. is bad to make because Jundam out always works. <laughs> well, I mean, if I play that Fireglass Mentor, I mean, yeah, I'm not drawing it late, but it wouldn't have been good on turn two. Uh, listener, we've got a Back to Basics episode today. So uh, if you are newer to drafting, newer to Magic, this is an episode for you. If you're older to Magic, if you've been doing this for ages, uh, you better stick around because maybe you've been making some bad splashes here and there, and maybe now's the time to correct that. So splashing, what is it? It's when you splish splash in a puddle. I, I, how many splash <laughs> jump and hop jokes are we going to make this podcast worst of all? I think we got to reel it back in a little <laughs> Oh, okay, because the fish, real, yeah, real fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Animal puns just write themselves. So what is splashing? Um, I guess first you've got to talk about, usually in a draft, you're going to do two colors. That's the primary vector you want to play. It's the easiest to fix. You can go monocolor sometimes, but generally you're going to see two colors. Splashing is when you add an additional color, but not going super heavy into it. You want to say like, what do you say? Like one to three basics is considered splashing. Anything more than that, you're basically playing a three-color deck. Mm -hmm. um, you really want to splash when you get bombs. You want to fix kind of holes in the deck you've built. We can kind of dive more into each of those topics, but in general, you're adding a third color without going overboard into this color. Right. I think Bloomboro is definitely a two-color set. Definitely. There's... This is probably one of the worst sets for splashing in, in quite a while, I'd say. Which is actually what inspired this episode. I've been seeing so many people 
splashing in this set. And I've been seeing people getting punished by it. And I want to make sure that you, listener, are not one of those people. I don't know. Maybe maybe even you can think back to a time when you tried splashing in the set recently and it, it didn't pan out that well. I certainly can. So the big question with splashing is, is it worth it? And there are many, many axes to consider here. The main one is, uh, is the risk worth the reward. So I think maybe a good place to start is, as always, with a little bit of vector theory. So if your deck's vector is assertive, if you were attempting to end the game quickly by attacking or maybe in some sets something else weird, I'm thinking like if you're trying to mill them out or if you're trying to win by poison or if you are trying to end the game fast, then splashing is automatically worse for you by default just because you have built your deck in such a way where you are trying to quote unquote curve out, where you are trying to uh, make sure your cards align faster and better than your opponents to either bring their life to hold to zero or bring their deck size to zero or something along those lines. This means that, I mean, if you try to play a splash card and then you have it in your opening hand, you're splashing some four drop and you don't have the mana for it on turn four and that's your only potential play that turn, you're skipping a turn. You're skipping getting that extra value on board or attacking your opponent or whatever it ends up being. Uh, and your deck likely does not have the tools to recover from that as easily as maybe like a defensive deck, which usually uh, are better able to access things like uh, ramp or uh, fixing uh, from things like, I don't know, every set has a three mana, go get a basic at this point, right? Heaped Harvest is the one in this set. If my bunny's opponent in Bloomborough uh goes like one drop two drop and then they take off turn three to play heaped harvest and they go get a red source i'm like okay they have balin obviously maybe they're maybe they played um burrow guy a burrow mentor right the uh the, the green white xx where x number of creatures you control burrow guard mentor uh if you don't play a three drop then that thing isn't growing and me as your opponent i'm like yes i can actually still deal with that in time uh plus now i know all right they have a balin coming down soon I better save a kill spell for that thing or else it could, you know, eventually take over. But then your bunny's opponent has sort of lost vector deck equity by not playing into the thing that the deck is trying to do. So I don't know about you, but I, I usually evaluate a card that I'm considering splashing on. First of all, how well does this align with my vector? Let's say I am playing something defensive. Uh, maybe I'm playing blue-green. And in pack three, I open Egra, Eater of All. And I'm like, whoa. That card's good. And maybe I already have uh, two lands that could tap for mana of any color, like an Uncharted Haven or, or some some land like that. Uh, and then I'm looking at this Ygra and I'm like, all right, is the risk worth the reward? No, that makes sense, yeah. And you, this, I guess, comes from just experience with the game too. You got to understand like, yeah, how powerful is this card? Even if this card doesn't work into the vector, is it strong enough that it's going to make a difference in this deck? Is it going to fill a slot in this deck that it's worth potentially not being able to play it and just having a dead card in hand, you know, it's a risk versus reward. I find splashing also tends to help you fill in the gaps. Like part of your vector is knowing what your deck's plan is. If you're playing that sort of, uh, say again, blue green frogs, that late game defensive, you're trying to spin your wheels, flicker a bunch of your weird little pawn profits and uh, other little trinkety guys, and then eventually win via something big. Ygra is something big, and if you are missing that, then that's the perfect card for your deck and for its vector. And sure, it doesn't pair super well with the whole blue-green flicker thing, but it does what your deck is trying to do. If you consider instead something like, I don't know, uh, green-white bunnies and this Balin example, Balin, that's meant for commander, right? You're clearly seeing a card that's supposed to go into a commander deck with perfect mana, and you're going to have it turn three every game if you want it. Maybe even something like splashing. I saw someone splash a Mabel in a green-white deck. Uh, they didn't really ever get it down on turn three, which is obviously when it's at its best, if you can start giving your stuff haste and whatever else with that equipment. Uh, if they're getting it down in the late game, then it's like, well, wouldn't you rather have just played like a solid three drop? I I'm I'm guilty of this, though. I, that, that The player was probably <laughs> me. I <laughs> but this is what I'm saying. Like, some of these cards are just so good that it's like almost difficult not to splash and this is a trap i guess i fall into a lot too where it's like i force a splash that's probably not beneficial for me 
but I want to play these cards, man. That's what I'm here to do. You know, it's kind of yeah. Uh, yeah. eat your vegetables sometimes, but sometimes you just want to have dessert. Well, I mean, that's we should mention as an aside, if you just want to do something nuts for the fun aspect of it, do it. It's your <laughs> you <know>? gems. <laughs> I mean, a, a good example is that um, Builder's Talent deck that we, we drafted uh, last week. Where I mean, I, I'm not going to say Hugs was correct to put in an Esper Builder's Talent deck, <laughs> but it was fun. It was and fun. That that was a lot of uh, equity that we got off of the fun of it. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but if you're looking to win more games, I would not recommend splashing Hugs in your Esper deck. Yeah. I, I I did have that one rotting in hand for a little bit. But uh, back to splashing according to your vector. Sometimes I what I will do is I will splash. A removal spell or two if i wound up super short on it this isn't the best set as an example for that but if you're thinking of sets where removal spells are just kind of necessary especially ones with um dual lands at common that's when splashing becomes trivially easy uh i mean think of something uh like uh outlaws right outlaws yeah. of thunder junction where you had common duels and you were committing crimes and removal spells were a pretty big part of the format uh you needed those throw from the saddles to be able to take out your opponent's uh griffs or whatever so if i didn't have enough removal in my let's say i was playing like blue black well then i would sometimes dip into red to grab like uh i don't know the three mana deal four or <laughs> ideally i would be playing grixis for like cruel ultimatum or something but that's you know that's whatever that is something that's worth splashing now here's something that i see a lot of players uh, especially those newer at the game they see this bomb and they're like okay i've heard that you can splash but it's a double pipped card take something like maha uh stupid good card obviously really strong obviously wins games when you get into play but if you're playing like blue red and you try to warp your mana base to accommodate that or even even if you have green touching your your uh deck if you're playing green white your bunny's deck doesn't necessarily benefit from Maha in the same way that it would any other five drop. You just want ahead of the homestead in instead, probably, right? Uh, that double pip is so much harder to get on curve than you can possibly imagine. Your mana would have to be ridiculous for that to work out. This set is a great example of not having great fixing a common. And yeah, the double pip just gets incredibly difficult. Unless you're touching green and you have those tappers that can tap for any color. You're really mm. destroying your mana base to flex for a card that potentially doesn't really help your deck anyway, as the Maha example in the bunnies. Yeah, and let's say you did go through with that. What happens when you have an opener and it's like plain swamp, swamp, and you have a couple green cards in hand? And it, maybe you do have Maha in hand. Uh, like you have the double swamps and you have the Maha, but then you have two dead green cards in hand. You're like, you do nothing till turn five. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're kind of screwed either way then. And then, you know. That powerful card, as powerful as it is, will not win you the game just by casting it. Now, if you have like a one pip card, uh, then you have to start evaluating more critically. If it is a, in particular, like a late game bomb, that's the sort of thing that splashing is better for, for the defensive vectors. So uh, the, I guess, offensive assertive vectors, splashing a late game bomb isn't as great for those decks because... You don't want the game to go late. You want the game to end by turn five or six or functionally be decided by turn five or six. You don't care about a seven mana bomb or whatever. Not that this set has too many of those, but uh, something uh, along the lines of, for some reason, the card that always comes to my mind uh, is Kaya, the the seven mana Kaya from uh, oh, Old oh, One. Yes. Which was the most aggressive format of, honestly, modern limited history. And Kaya is an awesome card. I've been playing a lot of it in Standard, actually. But you, so that powerful. card was just utterly garbage and limited because you're getting beat down by little infect creatures. And it was like, yeah. all right, seven mana, you're just never resolving this. So uh, as far as splashing goes, if you are in that defensive vector and you do come across, I don't know, another example from this set would be blue-green and you stumble across either like a Ygra or a Rowl, I could see. Uh, those cards are really strong. Then, if you can, if you know that it's on vector for you, then you need to start thinking about, all right, how am I actually going to guarantee that I'm able to cast this basically any time that it's in my hand? That's when you start needing to look at the fixing available to you. 
So again, this is a set without common dual lands and sets with them, they end up being pretty high picks. I usually take common duels, uh, something like fourth to seventh picks. That's kind of what I like grabbing those uh, to make sure I have solid mana for three-ish or two and a half color decks. If I have, say, one off-color pip, this Frogs deck with Yigra, let's use that as the example, I would want probably four or five black sources in my Frogs deck or four or five things that could tap. That could include uh, fetch lands, uh, like an Uncharted Haven sort of land, one that can enter and tap for mana many color, or the, uh, the surveilling one, that one works too, filter lands. Those aren't great, but... For late game bombs, I mean, you might have extra lands as is, and you top deck Ygra, and then you're able to cast it. Uh, any mana dorks that tap for mana of any color, those usually stick out to me. Uh, or if you have something like Heaped Harvest, ways to fetch out the lands. So I, I would say I probably want something like two lands and like two other ways to fetch out a, a type of that source. Is that about what you usually play as well? No, I agree. And I think a card I think we should mention here too is uh, three tree mascot. We saw that in your draft. And this is a great way to fix, especially in this set, it's a filter card. You pay one colorless and produce color of any mana. This is a colorless card. It fits in any deck. If you're going to splash, I'd love to grab one of these. You know, it's a two mm -hmm. mana, two one at worst. <laughs> and hey, if you don't believe us, maybe you'll believe raw numbers. <laughs> <laughs> believe the science. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you check out 17 lands, there is actually a tab that has this. Uh, if you go to deck color data, then you can see the win rates of decks of various colors. Uh, interestingly, mono white is doing. I mean, they've got some nutty cards in mono white. You know, you just get Warren, War Leader, uh, Valley Quest Caller, Call True. It A Day. Oh, mono red is getting pummeled. Poor, poor mono red uh, mages. So if we take a look at the two color uh, decks, these are about what you'd expect. This is what people usually look at when looking at the uh, vectors in the set, just to see what color pairs are doing well. Selesnia and Golgari are still both, you know, kind of leading the pack, 57-ish percent. Uh, yeah, there's some other decks that are starting to creep up there too. But now if we look down at two color plus splash, if you look and compare basically any of the two color decks with their two color plus splash, the win rate is just a hair lower. So Demir, for example, 54.3 down to 52.1. If you look at something like, uh, look at Golgari, 56.9, down to 54.3. And I would expect the ones that are most aggressive to be the most punished by this. Uh, for example, Is It currently has a 51.1% win rate as a two-color deck. I mean, poor, poor otters, right? <laughs> uh, but that's all the way down to 47.4% with Is It splashing. That's is gross. It is clearly not meant to be splashing in, in this set. Another one that you might not expect splashing to work out well for them would be Boros, right? Boros uh, as a two-color deck is 54.8, so around 55-ish percent win rate. And Boros with a splash is down to 53.5. So it might not seem like one or two percentage points are giving up that much, but you're giving up that much. I mean, that's a sizable, statistically measurable, apparently, uh, difference in win rate. Honestly, looking down at the three-color decks, yeah, uh, these all have abysmal win rates. We're I in saw like the low 40s, 40s. Like 43%. It's gross. But, yeah, yikes. Uh, stick with the two color decks, folks. Now, interestingly, if we take a look at just trophies uh, from Bloomboro Premier Draft, and again, this is very like circumstantial evidence, but let's just take a look at some of these decks uh, and their color identities. We'll notice that the decks that are splashing tend to, and have trophied, obviously, if they're part of this list. The decks that are splashing tend to be ones that favor more late game vectors. Blue green, we see trophy with a splash, a 7 0 here. Just gonna look at this deck, see what they're up to. Looks like a blue green deck. Uh, honestly, not even splashing. They're just okay. playing head of the homestead. Yeah. Must count that. They're playing a hidden grotto. I guess that sort of helps, but uh, if they ever were that short on, uh, on forests. Some other ones here, a lot of green black decks still trophying. A lot of these are splashing blue. That doesn't surprise me. White black doesn't strike me as the sort of deck that's going to splash all that often, right? So and this, there this, this, I mean, most of these decks that are splashing tend to be touching green. It looks like too, like mm -hmm. I, I, green is just if you're going to splash, you, you pretty heavily have to be in green. I'd say for a majority of formats, like greens, greens where you want to be. Mm -hmm. Even some of these decks that appear to be splashing are actually it's just counting the uh, the hybrid cards and their pips. So what appeared to be a black white deck splashing blue and red. 
Uh, it's actually just playing a cindering cutthroat and a couple seed pod squires. Oh, this deck looks tight. Uh, <laughs> nothing above four mana. That's a nice one. And uh, if we look at some of these red-white decks and, and green-red decks and white-green decks, these are just straight up two colors. Black-red, white-black, white-red. I mean, all these, no splashes, and these are what's doing well. Uh, as opposed to, I mean, sometimes you'll see stuff like this where it's those that are watching two uh, pips for the show the dominant colors, the green and white, and then a bunch of little smaller ones to show splashes. Sometimes if you're looking at, I don't know, cons of Tarkir, this will just be all five colors. It'll be like, all right, th this was a five color soup pile. Uh, DMU, like man. Dominar is yeah, Dominaria. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but this is as clear evidence as you could hope for that this is a two color set. And that splashing is probably not the best idea unless you are very set up for it with some sort of defensive vector and significant fixing. With that, let's just touch upon Bloomboro specifically. There are three three color cards in this format uh, Balin. The rabbit, which I think I've already kind of beaten into the dust here. I do not like splashing Balin at all. Glarb. Funny enough, I actually do like splashing Garb because I think Glarb fits right into that blue-green late game vector. Glarb is the uh, the 2-4 death toucher that lets you surveil and cast up off the top of your library if it has mana value 4 or greater or if it's lands. Uh, this is exactly what the blue-green deck does need to finish out games. It's massive card advantage. And it's honestly just a good onboard body, too. Glarb, I do think, is worth warping your mana base for a little bit. Uh, and Helga is the third one. I've messed around with Helga. I've attempted to play it in blue-green. I don't find it to be nearly as rewarding as splashing for Glarb. This one does not really pull its weight. I was going to say, I don't even, I've never played Helga, and I don't think I've ever seen anybody play Helga before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did get to go off with it once. But the thing about that one, uh, it triggers again off creature uh, creature spells only with mana value four or greater. Uh, that, I mean, how, how many of those are you putting in your deck? Like four, five, yeah, not max? a ton. Not enough to make it worth it. I mean, it does do a lot with those. It draws you a card, gains you a life, and put a counter on something. Or on Helga. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So uh, in Bloomboro, if you happen to open that pack three, pick one Yigra, and you're touching green, yeah, you should definitely take it and find a way to put it in your deck if you can you know, get the mana to work out properly. And if you're not super aggressive, like something like bunnies, uh, take all these lessons and I think you'll have a better time splashing. I don't know. I, I, I can remember when I first learned how to splash properly, when I started quote unquote eating my vegetables and my win rate definitely shot up because of it. I, I started making those like, all right, I opened this cool mythic, but I'm going to pass it and I'm going to take a boring common two drop instead. Yeah. Being smart with your mana. The, the one card in this set I'll always splash for, just to go out quickly here, is Vren. Dude, any deck oh. I'll, I have to put him in. He's just too good not to. Yigro seems to be your go-to for this uh, yeah. situation. Yeah, Vren and like three black kill spells. I mean, that's, that's a package worth putting in. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, there was a pretty big announcement. What was that, yesterday as of recording of this episode? I mean, we got Bye Bye Birdie finally. <laughs> I feel like we nah, should dude. jump right into it. No not, more not Nadu. Don't. Not don't. Yeah, yeah like not don't. Yeah. The amount of memes I've seen about Nadu leaving at this point, like it's been like 24 hours. People are yeah. stoked. I think people were cooking these up for months because everyone knew it was coming. Yeah, yeah. And, and we can kind of go through it. I, I guess we'll go through it quick here. Standard had no changes. Um, Pioneer, we saw Amalia and Soren get cut. Those those two decks like had a like they dominated the format you couldn't touch that or explore without running into one of these decks yeah i am honestly happy to see both of these go um the amalia combo deck really pushed a lot of the fair mid-rangey uh other like obzon style decks out of the format because yeah. i mean this deck does get to play a fair obzon mid-range thing except it also just kills you turn three like 50 percent of the time it's with its infinite combo not fun for anybody yeah, and the I'm draws curious. involved with like yeah. uh, giving uh, the wild growth walker indestructible. It's like, oh okay, come on, like what, what what's going on there? Um, um, I'm curious to see what the format's going to look like. I, I guess uh, people keep talking about is it Phoenix is going to kind of blow up there, but yeah, we'll see what interesting, happens? Uh, interesting to not ban treasure cruise to yeah. hamper Phoenix. Um, honestly, having played an awful lot of Pioneer in the last couple months, treasure cruise is. The best card in that deck yeah, uh, like phoenixes far. are good ledger shredders are great uh 
<laughs> but as a diehard humans and sometimes convoke player, what really brick walls you is when they they cast that treasure cruise. And you're Ancestral like, recall. Yeah, geez. it's no yeah. fun. Uh, yeah, and then modern. I mean, we have Nadu, and then I want to pay my respects here for Ben because <laughs> unfortunately, grief also got the hammer hit in modern. Uh, I'm, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but all I'm going to say is grief died for the One Ring's sins. Uh, all right, now that you brought the One Ring too, man, I am a little upset they didn't ban the One Ring. Like, I don't yeah. know. It's it's just I don't know. I don't want to complain that much about Magic, but it's just one of those cards. Like, it goes in every deck. You know, it's $125 now to buy this Jeez. one single card. I and don't know. I, I have been uh, seeing people intentionally trying to break the one ring, almost just for the sake of, like, let's get this thing going them. in yeah. December. Yeah, the next one I think is, like, December 12th or 16th or something. I, I've been seeing, uh, you know, the Red Way Energy decks that kind of took off after. Yeah, um, yeah. Like the yeah, they all play stuff. for one ring now. That what's what, <laughs> One ring goes in every deck, you it's know? A, it's just a like... card. It's a combo card. It's a control card. Um, I don't know. Watsy's still printing uh, Lord of the Rings sets, so I guess we'll see what happens. I, I honestly don't. Okay, you could they could make the argument that grief has some not fun play patterns. Uh, I would argue it's very fun when you're the one casting it, defenderating <laughs> <laughs> it. But I, I, I do get why people are saying it needed to go on the basis of fun. Yeah. Uh, I I do see massive card advantage engines such as Necro or the One Ring being the real issue uh otherwise i mean necro dominance that was one way you could abuse grief and like the soul spike whatever that yeah. card was that sort of pitching black cards uh, that you've accrued through paying life or if you're using the one ring at actually kind of the same thing um i i just wanted to play it almost fully fair in almost the reanimator <laughs> gorio's <laughs> reanimator uh all i wanted to do was Put a grizzled brand into play on turn three, and then double check that they didn't have a way to remove it in their nice. Hands. Like that's fair not magic. <laughs> that's that's how it should be. Uh, I don't know. I actually think Gorios will still have legs after this. Um, but it's it it. I don't know. I, I'm 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 off modern for a little bit until the uh, the format settles. Honestly, with this new announcement, uh, well, I guess we should finish one announcement until we get to the next one yeah right? uh, i mean legacy grief has gone too i don't i don't the know best. legacy that well vintage urza saga and vexing bobbler both restricted now it's interesting. i don't play that format i don't know what those cards do in that format yeah i don't really either uh, all i knew was that luris and uh like luris uh, urza saga decks were kind of the big thing in the format <laughs> but and, why vexing uh, boggle bobble i'm curious to know why i mean i don't know if you have any insight on this like i don't i don't know what would cause that to be restricted you know it's funny. I actually I did read um, in the release. I always love reading the ban and restricted release uh, like thoughts from the designers, mm. and then uh, I always find it really interesting their exact reasoning for banning certain cards at certain times. Because sometimes they come out of left field with a, a ban or unban that you didn't expect. Yeah. This I think is all pretty expected, at least for the formats that we're familiar with. But they mentioned that for vexing bobble, uh, they want to maintain vintage as a home for the most busted cards in Magic. Oh, in interesting. Grief fury uh every free spell just not uh, stacks no stacks pieces i guess is what well, the cutoff is here <laughs> yeah they, they decided that they wanted uh the free spells to still be able to work and vexing bobble had been shutting those down okay. so i, I kind of get that them, yeah. yeah and i guess actually by restricting uh, saga too that makes it way harder to get a vexing bobble in play i think mm. it sort of turned into like a who could get their bobble into play first type of okay. game and that's like all so right, it restricted the game enough that yeah nobody got to have fun and that makes sense Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, speaking of the articles associated with it, Nadu actually warranted an entirely separate article from the, the ban and restricted announcement uh, <laughs> that had a really interesting story behind it. Did you happen to read that one? I did not yet. No, you want to give us the synopsis? Sure. So it was a uh, sort of retrospective and also design description about how Nadu used to be apparently pretty far into the design process for MH3. Uh, it said, I forget if it, it itself had flash. I might have, but uh, not with flash. <laughs> well, the text on it was a lot different. The text was uh, permanence you control have flashed. You can flash in permanence. And uh, it only triggered off of things your opponents control, and it was once per turn. Oh, wow. And, okay. Uh, that something, seems fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Honestly, it would have been good in the draft chap cube. Yeah. Like the, giving blue green an extra flash card. Like that would. Come on. I mean, I, I think it might be a little too good now, but uh, anywho, 
yeah, having Nadu like that, apparently they wanted to buff it up a little bit right before release, and they'd already gone through the most rigorous of testing processes for, for all the cards. Uh, and there was something about bringing in external contractors that were doing testing work, which is a bit different than the way they handle most sets. And those contractors apparently did not catch the uh, many, many ways you could functionally go infinite and start recurring and set up ridiculous loops and massive board states with Shuko and other uh, zero cost activations. Funny enough, like, shouldn't they have caught uh, like lightning griefs and, and Nadu? Like if they were designing this, anyway, apparently uh, the change was made late in the design process to bump it up for commander players. And Classic I'm not going to commander players. <laughs> I, I, I don't even want to throw commander players under the bus, but I've, I mean, I'm a commander player. You could throw us under the bus, you know. Well, Watsi's yeah. been bottle feeding us for too long to the point where it's kind of destroying other formats. Like, example, here we go. This was modern Horizons yes. 3. I mean, yes. ridiculous stuff. So uh, it, it kind of goes back to, I think it was ages ago when, the, when there was some official release that said, like, not every format, or not, not every release is for you. Like, not every release is for every player. Well, I guess every release has to be for Commander players, regardless of what it does to other Well, that's formats. why we get Commander Precons for every single set now. That was a yeah. modern set we got Commander Precons for. Like, like, I just, I don't know. I, I, I see the appeal to Commander. My students love it. I oh, enjoy playing fun. Commander from time to time. It's a good format. Like uh, you were just talking about with like Vintage. It's a format where you get to play all these dumb, big, you know, chaffy cards at one point that yeah, you wouldn't really true. get to see in other formats. But um, yeah, the bottle feeding, the uh, you know, it's getting a little intentional too, design too much. But like even like MH3, we had commander cards in play packs. Right. You know, it's just yeah. it's too much at a certain point. But, yeah, uh, I don't like this sort of modern design trend where the question is answered for you. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense, but what I mean is these commander cards that uh, rather than asking you the player to see what can I do with this. They've been getting more and more overt with saying, look at this card. This is what you should do with it. Yeah. Even to the point of making so many precons per set. Honestly, I do, do we need four precons every set release? What if we went down to like two? It's overwhelming. Yeah, and you know, yeah. it's just it's a little too much. Yeah. Uh, and it, it has started to bleed in because, uh, well, I usually wouldn't care and I would just be like, all right, I, a lot of these cards I might just never see unless I'm playing commander with some friends that have pre-cons and I'm like, okay, maybe a little bit of novelty here and there. Uh, these cards have started to bleed into vintage cube. Uh, and that means as someone who does enjoy occasionally hopping on a vintage cube, I have to know what pyrogoyf does. It's like a tarmogoyf with a, it does other stuff. It's like a flame tongue kavu stable to a, I don't know. <laughs> it's just gross. Yeah, I don't know. it's just overproduction at this point. But we we could keep talking about how Watsi wants to churn out more and more product. But I think we're just beating the dead horse at this point with that. Mm -hmm. uh, one other announcement that we should mention is the Spotlight series, which looks yes. great. Very excited for that. So it's a series of tournaments. I could read you all the text about it, but it's basically GPs are back. <laughs> oh, I'm excited, dude. I I only really started like jumping into like RCQs this year, and yeah. the fact that this is kind of now back in the spotlight, it's quite exciting. Yeah, nice. yeah <laughs> I only went to I think one or two Grand Prix before uh, really COVID and before everything kind of mm. shut down and they kind of killed competitive magic formally for a long time. But anyway, <laughs> happy to see them back. I, I knew William Huey Jensen at the lead uh, of competitive play. Uh, obviously, you put someone like that in charge and stuff's going to go right. So I'm very happy to hear that these are coming back. Um, I'm, I'm personally getting stoked for KubeCon in a couple months. And uh, with the return of the Spotlight series sort of acting like Grand Prix. Uh, that gives me another future tournament to look forward to. So uh, those are going to be standard for the first bit of them. And uh, that means I, I get to start playing some standard. And, and I'm, I'm sort of in this, in this um, lame duck standard format right now <laughs> where, where Boros Convoke is a good deck, but the Wandering Savior or whatever the card is called is coming in the next set. And it's also a five mana Convoke creature with a good ETB. I'm like, oh man. 
convoke heads were, were so back. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, we didn't really touch on standard too much when we were talking about the ban announcement, but I've been having mm. a blast with standard. I was never yeah. a standard player. I've been rocking this Boros mid-range token control deck. I don't know, man. I'm having Whoa. a ton of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. You know, it's Caretaker's Talent's obviously the big card in the set to draw advantage, mm. but I'm having a good time. It, it feels like good old-fashioned magic. You know, I uh, I saw someone playing Lizards the other, the other day. In Standard? Uh, in Standard, yeah. So nice. they went they went turn one, uh, whatever that one drop, it's a one-two and With a pings the on attack. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> turn two, they played Gev. Turn three, they played Laughing Jasper Flint. Is he, he's a lizard, isn't he? He's a lizard. <laughs> uh, is that yeah, just? It's not targeting though, off of Gav, right? It's. Uh, no. <laughs> what do magic no. cards do? Yeah, uh, I don't remember either. Crimes. Well, I guess I guess uh, Gev does commit a crime. Okay. So, I, I guess you could play the crime cards. I don't know. I I, I think the, that deck actually. I mean, it, it. I did lose to it while I was playing Convoke. Oh. I had a pretty weak draw. They had a pretty good one, but uh, lizards as a competitive deck seems kind of sick. And uh, I, honestly, I do want to see where the standard format shakes out. I tend to settle on the aggressive deck that I have the most fun playing. But Mono white humans? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm a white weenie diehard. But but Kaya, seven mana Kaya is still legal in this format. Oh, wow. And I have loved resolving that card. Atrax is still legal. Domain hasn't entirely disappeared. People are just playing instead of the triumphs, they're playing the uh, the surveil lands from MTM. Surveil's great, yeah. There's gonna be a lot of shakeups with standard because we have dust war coming out in basically two weeks, three weeks at this point. Yeah, but then we have foundations <laughs> coming out in uh, November, which is right gonna be yeah. this almost staple format for standard. So it's mm. gonna be quite interesting to see where standard goes. When did the uh, do you know when the spotlight series like officially starts? Like what the first event is? Is it next year? I'm assuming at this point. Yeah, we can drop a link to it in Discord. I forgot okay. off the top of my head. but So foundations and stuff are going to be legal at that point. So I'm curious oh, yeah. to know where yeah, we're going to yeah. settle with standard by then. Mm -hmm. Should be cool. I'm excited to have a constructed format that, that Convoke costs like 80 bucks. Like That's <laughs> nice. I could sell a couple cards from Modern and yeah. just have a standard deck ready to go for major tournaments. And that that feels pretty good. With that... Let's jump into our listener question of the week. This one comes from Wolf of Panis in the Discord. If you have any questions to ask, propose, chat, say, anything that's on your mind, hop over in Discord and ask. Uh, Wolf asks, put in the game devs or the uh, cube crafter hat on, what have we learned from Bloomborough? And uh, Wolf also mentions uh, that they were personally convinced that a Spellslinger deck needs an opt variant. I actually fully agree with this. I don't think the mouse cantrip was nearly good enough for what the uh, the otter no. deck needed. In, in, I don't. In, I can't think of any like instant speed one mana card that is played right. Like that's probably what really did hurt the is it deck. Like mm -hmm. you, you don't have this interaction that is needed. Yeah, opt would have been great for this. Yeah, I was trying to think about how uh, otter ball antics could be retemplated into a cantrip that I do feel like the mm -hmm. deck needed. I obviously making opt make a 1-1 one, one prowess was too good, too good I, I yeah. even think uh without the scry just one mana make a 1-1 one, one prowess draw card that at instant probably, speed like, or at sorcery break, speed probably like break vintage or something <laughs> like uh, uh or pioneer the least so I, I i think it probably should be something like two mana uh make a 1-1 one, one prowess draw card and then not have flashback or have flashback for like six or something and not put mm. a counter on um so, something along those lines. Something that I learned personally from this set is that I enjoy sets with uh, common dual lands a lot more yes. than ones that I don't. <laughs> yeah, no, we had a lot of those in the last couple sets, and this is the first set in a while, and I was like, oof, yeah, really, really missing those. Yeah, common fixing. I, I guess I also enjoy sets where the vectors are less narrow, and I think the common dual lands are a big aspect of that. I mean, if you think about the ideal curve out from a lot of the decks in this format, it usually involves the mentor of those colors and the mentors all basically cost between two and four mana right yeah so those are a big part of it i mean if you go like i mentioned earlier in this very episode turn one one drop in bunnies turn two burrow guard turn three i don't know carrot cake or something like the game is basically over and i don't like that aspect it is still one of the fastest formats we've had in recent memory because of those quick curve outs and uh I don't know. The the play draw advantage is still a little higher than I'd like. I guess I also like it where the play draw advantage is is pretty even. 
let's hop into Teferi and Tibble. Ah, hop. Oh my God. Let's hot. Splash, <laughs> splash our way into Teferi and Tibble. There we go. What's up with you this week? Uh, so yeah, roses this week. Uh, I've actually had back to back extended weekends. Me and my wife took off Whoa. last Thursday and Friday. And then we have Labor Day weekend coming up, man. I'm enjoying not going to work as much as I usually do. Very nice. Uh, and then Tibble. So we're the, yeah, we're, we're going to the doctors like every two weeks now because she's at the 30 week mark. And it's like a 45 minute drive for me there one way. So it's just a lot. I have my own doctor's appointments up. I hate going to the doctor. I'm like, I'm a hypochondriac. I'm like stressing about getting blood work. Yeah. But mm. how about you, man? How's, uh, how are you looking? Well, uh, my Tibble is actually. And also an aspect of that, I've had a couple big doctor's appointments I've been putting off for a long time, and now I have to go see what insurance in network doctors I have in my area. Wait, wait, all right, can we talk about the American uh, healthcare system real quick? Do we have a <laughs> dude? Give me, give me three hours. Yeah, and a lot of bleeping swear words. I spent I... so much time, yeah, finding a doctor in network, and then you call them, and then it's like, oh, we can't, we're not looking for new patients, or like three weeks till we can see them. <laughs> like, what, what are we doing here? <laughs> Yeah, it's like, well, I kind of need this thing checked out now. And they're yeah. like, uh, jump off a bridge. Like, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's the whole thing. Uh, I, I have um, I have school tomorrow, which I, I didn't today. Today I'm still on summer break and tomorrow I'm not. So I, I guess, um, you, know, you know how they say the Sunday scaries? Yeah. Uh, I have the equivalent of an entire summer's worth of weekend and then an entire 10 months worth of school week or like that's work gross. week. Yeah. Um, and I know, I know people say like teachers getting the summers off is like worth it. Uh, I, I would contest that a little bit in that my weekends, I don't really have off. Uh, I like grade all weekend. I, I I'm still going to be jamming RCQs until, <laughs> until, uh, I, until I literally can't anymore. But uh, this school year does make, socialization in general very difficult yeah um, that makes sense do yeah you get anxious like uh like with a whole new student body like how is that for you i've never really thought about that as a teacher Ooh, yeah I mean, it's like you're meeting a bunch like it's what like how large is your classroom it's like i don't know you're gonna meet a ton of new people learn a ton of new names it, oh yeah i'm gonna have uh, about 85 new names Ugh. memorized in the next uh, week wow and i mean i put a lot of pressure on myself to be welcoming and that sort of thing not a lot of teachers you know, memorize all the kids' names and all that stuff that quickly. But I, I try to because uh, if I'm not intentional about it, I, it doesn't happen in my brain. Gotcha. So uh, I do tell my kids that after they leave, like once they graduate my class, that uh, they should always introduce themselves with their first and last name when they see me in the hallways because I'm like, I'm sorry, but my brain can only handle like 300 names at a time. Like, you got to remember all those magic cards, man. That was, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. I prioritize. Well, yeah, even, even in this episode, so many times I've been like, the one man a lizard that does this thing. It's like, just it's associate funny how brains each kid like with a specific card from like Bloomboro or like Deskmore. <laughs> like you rabbit. Fell. You. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, my it's a fairy this week. I am excited to get back into somewhat of a routine. I do find that I have healthier habits throughout the school year in some aspects. Um, trying to establish that routine early and stick to it uh, feels motivating. Uh, my other Teferi was that my girlfriend moved over the weekend and it was a it was a massive undertaking, given that the night before was her birthday party. Oh, wow. Which maybe, maybe didn't plan. Maybe that wasn't the best, but anyway. <laughs> Either way, excited for a new school year. And uh, I wonder if any of my new students have found the show. Gulp. <laughs> not, not super likely. If so, they wouldn't have made it this far in. And if they did, um, you have homework to be doing. You should so, be studying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You actually had a science lesson here. We talked about the Sunfire link. So That's you did, true. You, know, you started yeah. them with it. Yeah, uh, if you if you heard this far, I'd like a report on the uh, CNO cycle <laughs> on my desk by Monday. <laughs> With that, thank you for listening, listener. You're the best. Uh, patrons, you're also the best. Thanks for keeping us going. If you're interested in supporting the show for 25 cents an episode, please hop on over to Patreon and, uh, you know, give what you want to. Uh, those that follow us on social media, thanks to you as well. Hop in Discord if you're not there for that. Always nonsense happening in Discord. And with that, see you next week. I, every time we say hop now, I can't stop. Like It's just like, we I, did we say hop too many times this episode? <laughs> I don't think so. And with that, I, I actually do want to hop into the into the sign-off real quick because uh, I have... So for for this uh, birthday party that I... I, I kind of was like the host for it. Did I okay. tell you about what this was? The, no. the game show theme? 
No, I don't think you did. Oh, this is okay, interesting. Oh, okay, wait, you know, so, you kind of did, but remind me here. I thought so, right? So there's this uh, the streaming service Dropout, right? Okay, yes, uh, I love Dropout. Yeah, their show Game Changer. Great. I hosted a Game Changer episode for my girlfriend's Ooh, birthday. Okay. And uh, this was the, ev- it was the episode we pulled from was called um, Do I Hear One Dollar? It's, okay. it's the episode where there is an unknown amount of money in a safe. And Sam Rice just has the contestants do ridiculous stuff for money. For money, and yeah. They, it's like a race to the bottom where they're undercutting each other. Like, yes. I'll drink toilet water with a straw Text, for ten dollars. Yeah. Texture then, X for whatever and lowest lowest. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah. So, uh, I, <laughs> I, I made my own version for okay. this party, and I'm honestly super proud about how it came out. <laughs> Hold on, I can Are we gonna play right now? <laughs> I can show you. All right, so here it is. Uh, you forgot the whole logo. Wow, you're going to get sued now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, they won't see that. Uh, so anyway, the idea was we also pooled. We had, we came up with 400 bucks, which is not too bad. Oh, for wow, Russia. that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it starts pretty tame. Do some okay. jumping jacks, eat a fuego taki and hot sauce. Uh, listen to Mamba number oh, five. No. <laughs> These, I think, all went for $1. It just so happens that my girlfriend loves fuego takis and spicy things. So she was like, I'm in. Like, I'm in. I'll I do it for free. <laughs> It was like ghost pepper sauce. Oh, I geez. had a taste of it. I was burning my mouth for an hour. So uh, this was a funny one. Uh, <laughs> this <Yeah>. one. <laughs> you can see where I'm going with this. Uh, okay. All right. Classic. Work. Classic. Yeah. Uh, eat Ooh. Nerd's Gummy Cluster Soaked in Vodka. See, I would this do this was... for free, dude. I, 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 I love nerd Gummy Cluster. I don't know if you would have <laughs> if you'd seen what they looked like after five minutes. Well, okay, the how long did they soak? out. Okay, yeah. Uh, they looked pretty whack, but um, step barefoot on Legos. This, <sighs> I think, went for a, a lot of money. This was like a 20-ish, $20-ish $25 <laughs> one. Brutal. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty oh proud my. of this one. <laughs> did anybody so, do this one? <laughs> oh, yeah. So call and order a pizza using like an over the top basically racist italian <laughs> accent like like mario luigi esque uh the person who ended up doing it actually played it for a funny spin she ended up doing like a like a jersey shore like a hey, right. like <laughs> oh honey i need this now <laughs> like that sort of like you italian Mar- grandma you said mario i was going to do can i just do chris pratt at that point <laughs> <laughs> well i mean apparently uh so letting a volunteer sharpie your face was a funny okay. one Belting a song on the street. Uh, Mambo number five guy better have done whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so it was funny. Mambo number five uh, actually did this one while having Mambo number Mambo five in her ear. I couldn't do time. that. Uh, this one I was pretty proud of too. <laughs> <laughs> Call the pizza place back and apologize for the accent that was in the accent, or just apologize, just flat, <laughs> just just uh, just apologizing, and also reiterate that you still want the pizzas. It also was like our dinner for the evening, uh, like an ex's recent okay, like, post. Call a family member and tell them you joined a cult. Oh my god! What time of night was this at? Too like if my mom this gets to call like, at like midnight. This was like ten. This okay. is uh, we're pushing it. So the second round, uh, the deals themselves can be bartered, like what you'll Ooh. do with it and how much money you'll do it for. And then we revealed that at this point there were like two fifty dollars left in the pot. The contestants yeah. were all very surprised by that. Uh, raw egg. The winner ended up cracking an egg over her head while also egging the next door oh building. <laughs> That's right. You guys uh, were moving out the next day anyway, right? So who cares? Exactly. Also, the building was abandoned because it burned down in a fire a year oh, ago. Oh <laughs> boy. <laughs> so the actually the raccoons in there are probably I was eating say, that did- egg as we speak. Did this person light the apartment on fire? <laughs> uh, well, actually, uh, for letting a personal possession on fire, I, I I have beef with the way this one was handled. The winner lit a dollar bill on fire for twenty dollars, oh, and okay, uh, the other two people I think by this point were too out of it to. <laughs> That's comment. just called investing in cryptocurrency. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, why didn't someone offer a bill of twenty or yeah. burn a twenty for thirty dollars? Like yeah. you could have kept going up. more. Yeah, but. Uh, Someone posted on Instagram of their sharpied face. That was a pretty good bit. Uh, someone poured ice an ice bucket down their pants. That nice. was solid. Uh, we ended up skipping the ping pong paddle uh, and skipping this one. With the with the electric razor, I can't actually say what happened with this one <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> Save that for the after after show. <laughs> Drop chat at night. <laughs>